For generations, Ventura has thrived on the dedication and determination of extraordinary individuals, cultures, and families that guided and inspired our community. Family members from these pioneering families celebrate their remarkable histories by sharing captivating stories and personal memories. These are Ventura Legacies. Joining us today for the next Ventura Legacy story is someone who really needs no introduction. Julie Tumamite Stensley is one of the true historians, knowledgeable people of the Chumash tribes and other historic elements of the Ventura community. So, Julie, Thank you. thanks for joining us. Great Thank to you see very you much. again. Thank you. I don't even know where you want to start, but I think that uh, historically, give us a context of where, where, the, where the family, your family fits into the whole Ventura Legacy. Well, it's on my father's side, um, Tumamayat. That was his, their native name that he grew up with. He was born in 1919. His grandfather, Juan de Jesus, was my great-grandfather. Grew up through that mission period, saw the workforce, saw everything going on out there, learned quite a bit. His parents died when he was young. I've told the story a lot of times, but it, I always still find it fascinating. The name Tumamayat was given to him as his parents died, an orphan, one who was raised by his grandparents and learned to carry things on his back. So that last phrase, metaphorically, of it still holds today. We are carrying so much weight on us in revitalization of our culture, helping educate people in the appropriate ways of our culture. We are carrying a huge, heavy load because <laughs> there's so few of us that have, mm -hmm. have taken on um, what it means to be native in today's world. But he grew up in Ventura. Uh, he had uh, three children. Lino, Cecilio, and Marie Antonia Leva, uh, Tumamite Leva. They worked the fields. They were given land there in Ventura, and he grew lima beans for the church property and other, you know, fruits and vegetables. And his son Cecilio would take him, you know, the wagons out through the neighborhoods. So they grew up here. This was, but when we started learning about when my father. Um, retired from Shell Oil after working the oil fields in you know his own land and Cañada Larga Ranch finding oh. artifacts everywhere as he'd work and dug in the land. He didn't really, he knew and we've always known we were a Chumash, but we didn't have our ancestry. We didn't know his father taught him a lot of things in the natural world about how he learned from his father and the generations before of doing certain things and going certain places. So my father really, we were living and acting and being Indian, but it wasn't like, oh, this is sacred, you have to protect this. Or uh, the, the subservience and the uh, workforce that our families ended up becoming after mission period and during mission period really didn't have the voice that our great-grandfather did as a capitan in Ventura. My father's parents were both Chumash on both sides, except my grandmother, her father was from Sonora, Mexico, some of those first people coming mm -hmm. in through the expeditions. So we looked at our lineage. We had uh, anthropologist John Johnson, who's been looking at Chumash genealogy through baptism records for now 40 years or more. I mean, he knows them. And um, so when we started getting involved in our culture through the cultural ways of storytelling, um, the arts, uh, language, storytelling, all of that, it was like as if our fa my father and I really just, you know, opened up and just were, couldn't get satisfied <laughs> in mm -hmm. all the knowledge that was there. And we learned that our families come from literally all parts. Uh, we have the best genealogy. And through, of course, it's through the baptism records and that, you know, that whole tragic period of time. But it did document our family. So we have on my father's father's side from Santa Cruz Island to Malibu, coming through villages all the way down into Ojai in that area. And his mother's family is from Santa Rosa Island. So they crossed over to Carpinteria went north up into San Luis Obispo County, Cuyama, which is the back country, and then back again through that same corridor, through Ojai, what we call Highway 33. Those are all, what we're riding today, what we hike on, what we bike on, what we drive on are all trade routes that connected all these neighboring tribes with one another, and bands actually, not so much tribes, kind of a misnomer. What's we, the difference between a tribe and a band? Well, a tribe gives a connotation like you're on a reservation, you're all in one political uh, social continuity, 
with one another. And the territory is so big, there were many leaders in each area of 7,000 square miles of territory, including four Channel Islands. So each uh, village, major villages, had their own leaders independent from one another. I see. So where you had in Santa Barbara, Yanunali, which there's a great street named after him, he during mission times and the Presidio times ruled over like three, 13 villages. And so he's a very powerful um, wot, as we called him. They, we didn't have the word for our uh, for chief. It was a wot. So and, and women were leaders. The last one here in the Ventura County, Pomposa, was out in Satkoy, or Satakoy as we say today. So she was the last woman chief, and that was like late 1800s. And there's stories in the Signal at that time, which had a great festival out there. Um, so anyway, getting back to that, just this origin of who we were. Um, it goes back thousands of years. When, when people ask me, how's it feel to be in your homeland? I said, it feels great. <laughs> you know, we have this lineage going back 13,500 years and even more, you know, that, I, that is just that by scientific terms. You know, people, all, all peoples around the world have creation stories of how we got to where, mm -hmm. you know, our language holds us, our rituals hold us, our culture holds us. So um, our creation stories have us being created right here. One uh, very uh, beautiful one called the Rainbow Bridge that has us coming from at the time when all the islands are all one and they crossed over on a, a magical, beautiful rainbow bridge going over the ocean. But then there's an earlier one. That one, that, the Rainbow Bridge story was told by Tomas Ignacio, an elder in Santa Barbara. Then we have a creation story that was relayed to us by Maria Solaris from San Inez. And it has us being create, well, first in many traditions, there's multiple worlds. Like the Norwegians have like nine, Germans have like multiple African people and some nations have multiple flat worlds that mm -hmm. lay on top of one another. So we're not very different from any of those. We had three worlds. So when our world here, uh, the first people perished in a flood. So we had, we had to put man back in the world. So they were created in Maria's story up in the upper world by the sky people and then somehow we're brought and transported down into the middle world here. So, you know, we have those creation stories that hold us right here to this land, not to some other, but you know, as, as we, we're now knowing that here in North America, through the Bering Straits as the land bridges melted and opened up, some people, yes, came through those land strips, but also there's the coastal migration, mm -hmm. that some of our mitochondrial DNA has us connected with that coastal migration pattern. What's your mission? What, what are you trying to get across and when, and who are you trying to reach? I have started some of my early, it's been over th almost 30 years now that I started this journey. Some of my first ceremonies I did were funerals and it was something my father, I remember just growing up, I, out of everybody, he would just take me off and put me in this you know, situation with him where we'd go to these funerals and he'd talk to me about death and how he wanted to be and how, you know, his view. And, and then I started doing weddings because I had to balance that <laughs> <laughs> too. I love plants, I love animals. I actually wanted to be a veterinarian, but I love dance also. I mean, I'm a multifaceted person mm -hmm. and I love knowing. And when I am asked questions, because of our last name, Tumamaya, people always say, oh, you're Chumash, why don't you speak to us in your language? They're, you know, we didn't grow up that way. But there's, there's always that opportunity now that I know where the language is. And through my research, self-study, I did go to college for a couple of, university for a couple of years, but I'm better at going out there when I did the archeology. span So, you know, so I am trying to reach out to everybody, but I love the third, fourth grade class. I love being with the children. They're, they're fun and they're smart and they get it. You know, and I keep trying to tell them, you're the ones that's gotta take over. You know, you've got to recognize your natural world. We do wonderful programs with them through music and art, but we also do ethnobotany. Like uh, there's some wonderful programs we've done with the oak trees. And many kids, especially here in the city, uh, they don't know what an oak tree is. You show them an acorn and they go and go a nut. You know, there's some elemental um, education that People take for granted that these children need to know the natural world because they are going to be the stewards. Because now that it's a mixture of all these different people, um, there's, there's a science, there's a culture, there's a spirituality to every single plant that's here and that was recognized by the Chumash. And so in order to, you know, to, to share that, you have to, I, ha I have to be at all these different levels. 
And if there's something I don't know, then it's really been hidden away from us through the mission period because there were education, things that were not allowed to be spoken of. And there's things within our culture pre-mission that weren't allowed to be spoke about in, in, um, within the community itself. Certain uh, medicines and certain rituals that were hidden from the people during ceremonial times that we will never know. So I'm looking at my children as they grew up with, with what I was doing. I started pretty much this in around 1985, and that was my first daughter was born. And she comes with me. She loves doing the programs like at Ojai Day mm -hmm. or when we did Oliva Sadobi Cowboys and Indians thing. We, mm -hmm. we still do that together. My middle one is 19, and she, you know, every teenager goes through that period of, I hate everybody, Mom. <laughs> and my youngest <laughs> son, but she's coming Shumash back. Is yes, my kids. Oh, yes, every generation, <laughs> no matter where you're from. Oh, it's funny, but she's starting to come around again. She actually performed with us at the night at the Arlington for the showing of the West of the West. And I was really proud of her. And, and um, she even dressed in her regalia that she hadn't worn in a long time. So it was nice. My son, who's 17, has autism. And so he's very regimented in his, I don't know if he knows it, and but it's always when the timing is right. So, you know, autism is a very fascinating way of communication. So if he decides to communicate in his culture, in the culture, I hope it's through art, because mm -hmm. he loves to draw and he wants to do storyboard telling, animation, things like that. So maybe he'll do something Very there. Very cool. Yeah. How do you learn the, um, the, the well, you, have the, you mentioned the rituals, but also the ceremonies and all of that? I mean, it seems like there was a, there was a break in passing that information there along. There was, but there were, like I said, where some people will know some of the, like say for instance, our Hutash festival. That was something that started here in Ventura. When the Spanish came here, they went to two very powerful, what they call Antap villages. One was Shishalap by the beach, and it was a very uh, rich political and spiritual with a lot of political leaders, not leaders, but people who were engaged in this politics as well as ritual. Then you had uh, over by Foster Park, that Cañada Larga area, mm -hmm where they were having temescals and sweat lodges there. And my great grandfather was a part of that with some of the other families. That's where they put uh, the San Gertrudis Chapel right there before the missions. And then San Miguel Chapel on Thompson. Well, after the missions were built, they let, you know, the, they let the people still do ceremony, but like they changed uh, Feast of St. Michael's is the last Sunday in September. So our harvest festival, or our Thanksgiving for people who don't understand the harvest, that, that was in the end of August. So they just kind of slightly moved ours a little further up to September to coincide with the Feast of St. Michael's. And so they, they allowed them to do ceremony. It was a five-day event. There was people from all over nations, from the south to up the Tohon area, the Yokuts would come, and they would do ceremony out there at the chapel, doing, having processions coming up from Shishalop with uh, young boys carrying these beautiful three banners, some that indicated rain. There were uh, planks, like boards, with abalone that looked like raindrops coming down, and then one of the sun and moon. And the procession, women and children would be throwing a grounded, leached acorn flower on the ground as offerings. They were like banners with beads hanging on that would be burned in ceremonial bonfires to honor those that have passed, uh, those that will pass, Everybody was danced to, the bear, the eagle, the swordfish, the skunk, the coyote. Because uh, when we talk about God and when the kids in the fourth grade want to know, did the Chumash believe in God? I said, yes, but the God, we didn't have a word for God. Most native peoples don't. <laughs> Uh, and, um, and so the, the honoring, the, the prayers, the dances, the rituals, the, the, the gifts were given to these individual animals, people, plants, uh, water, you know, everything. So all the prayers went to them. And the sun was about as close to the god as we could get, and the moon, both the male, the sun was a male deity, the woman, uh, the moon was a female deity. And so this, these rituals went on for days and days and days. There were horse races down Thompson, if you can believe that. Uh, some of the people from up north brought bears down. They'd be like a bear, bear fight, you know. So that went on into the 30s. So it was well documented, this Hutash festival. And, and then it moved over to the fairgrounds and later became the Ventura County Fair where you can see pictures of the Yokut still coming down, building the ops out there with the Chumash men. Uh, one of our relatives, Wanai Romero, 
is featured in a, in a photo. There are the yokuts and the regalia dancing there. So it, it did go up until that later period. So we have that full and it's, you know, the different songs and dances that were done. We don't have the recordings mm -hmm. of the songs, but we have words that my father and, and uh, his friends put together. And then we have offerings, our knowledge of the winter solstice ceremony that used to take place on top of Taylor Ranch. That was a solstice place. And, and it's kind of the same thing. You're honoring people. It's the end of the year. There are certain caves in our territory with holes in the walls that a man would observe every day as you get closer to the winter solstice, which is December 20th, 21st, sometimes 22nd. And when that sun hits that center of the hole and marks the back of the cave, winter's started. And the rest, there was 30 days in each month, 12 months in a year. And so that last final days of the year, ceremonies were done, dances were done, and again, nobody remembers many of them. There's only a few, but the offerings, the way the ceremonial poles were placed on the ground, uh, feathered poles with condor feathers facing east and west because that's where the energy flows of the prayers and the vibration because of the way the sun and moon come up and, and make their travels around the world. So um, that, that corridor, that opens up for us in these times when we do rituals, very important. What, what mm -hmm. hit me is how much you, you revere all of it. You, mm -hmm. re, you, you revere the entire ecosystem. It isn't just you're saying, you know, you're revering the elders, but also the animals and the, yes. the plants. And yeah. it's, it's That's what kept us. That's what kept us alive. In the droughts, um, when and there were famines and El Ninos that just wiped everything out, nothing grew. I mean, we're in one right now you know, these last four years, and look at damage that's been done with this El Nino mm -hmm. and the people being wasteful of water and um, all these people now. I mean, we're about two decades late of these sustainable gardens and everybody growing their own. Now we're using so much water that, you know, we're, we're in a crisis right now with it. Um, getting back to the rain dances, you know, we, we are praying for rain, but I'm also telling people don't pray like this because, you know, they're listening and we don't need what happened on the highway, you know, when they had the fire and then the freeway got nearly wiped out. So, you know, we have to be very cautious about what we pray for and what we be very specific of what you pray for. But um, yeah, it, it should be all inclusive because we affect everything in this world right now. We are so arrogant uh, that we have the right to conquer the earth. Right. And when earth, you know, mother, <laughs> she could only tolerate us for so long and then she says okay kids I've had enough mm -hmm. and bang you know we get devastated mm -hmm. when we you know oh you want rain okay. <laughs> yeah. I remember that time they tried to declare the Ventura River dead <laughs> <laughs> that was quite a while ago and and uh, the rains came and blew out um, Emma Wood State Beach and almost our old bridge the Ventura mouth of the right. Ventura River yeah gotta be careful what got you interested as a, as a, as a child? What, what threw the switch? Yeah, you know, we grew up in the river bottom and Miner's Oaks, and there's seven of us. I'm the youngest. And I was kind of like my sister, or my oldest sister, Rachel, she'd say, you know, yeah, she was so cute when she was little. We used to treat her like a little weed. She just kind of we'd water her and feed her every now and then. But she was always on her own, and I was. I was always out in the fields. We lived in a, in a neighborhood that the houses were, you know, like two or three houses down the road. So we had fields all around us. We had an orange orchard on the other side. But I always found myself out in the fields, you know, just picking ladybugs, you know, getting little ladybugs and playing with plants and picking flowers. We hiked all throughout that area, through the river and, and um, down into Wilson Rice Canyon. We would also go out to the Matillaha Canyon area up Highway 33. And I would hear, I would, I would see the mountains and I would look at them and I'd just get frightened of the feeling I would get. It turned out my brother Leo felt the same way too. He had told his son that. And what we know about the hills and rocks in our tradition is that those first people, the Momola Cuico, they were called, and they were big giant animals and people that roamed the world. But remember I mentioned the flood and how we had to be created. Well, those people perished. They became the mountains and hills and stones around our world. And we see them, there's Whale Rock Ranch in the east end of Ojai, and then there's this beautiful, as you're coming down the Conejo grade, profile of a woman to your left. Mm -hmm. You only see her for mm -hmm. a slight second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's looking out towards the north. So, you know, we know they're there, but for some reason as a child, the vibration of that, um, even now when I go up into the Matillaha Canyon, I just, um, you know, just go in there with 
great intention and I don't dally, <laughs> do what I need to do and I go. But you know, I just always kept hearing, I have to know. And so when, again, with our name being associated, we always knew we were Chumash. And being the youngest of, of you know, seven siblings, they didn't want to. They didn't, they didn't want to, do, to, to pick up where that place, you know, where the, our families left off. When my father started doing what he was doing, when he retired from Shell and he was singing in a little group with Michael Ward and Clarence Sterling, the Painted Cave Choir, they called themselves. And they went everywhere, they were so cute together. And they were making up some and, and putting together melodies for some of these songs that were in the books with just words and they would put the, the, so some of the songs are singing, the melodies are improvised. So I started, you know, seeing what he was doing. Um, when my daughter was born in 85 and I had gone to UCSB and I started meeting Lakota, Navajo, Kiowa people um, out there. And I was envious to, to know, I mean, even though I knew I was native, I didn't have enough knowledge. I didn't know at that time where to go to get it. I was 17, 18 years old. And it wasn't until I was into herbs and plants and I love homeopathic natural remedies mm -hmm. with plant material. And I used to cure my little animals that way with, with a homeopathic and herbal treatments. And so when I went to meet, you know, to college and met these people, it really started getting me more excited about where I could go. I didn't know that there were books on our culture written already. I loved Greek mythology. And so I used to read those all the time. Mm -hmm. If I had known in like 1972, December's Child by Thomas Blackburn was written and it's 111 of our oral traditional stories. And um, I was like, wow, it's just transfer from one to the other because mm -hmm. they were almost exactly alike. <laughs> just creation stories, behavioral mm -hmm. stories, mm -hmm. how things got created, death involving a lot of these creation stories. And then as, as I started, when my first daughter was born, uh, she was three, I started doing monitoring through Candelaria American Indian Council. And um, at that time, the, the person I, who was my boss is now my husband, Bruce Stensley. He was working out there. He says, well, what am I supposed to do? What do you mean monitor? Look for bone and shell. All right. <laughs> but because I was a child growing up at the beach and I never got in the water, I was either out walking, looking around, looking for pretty rocks or on the beach looking for pretty shells. The, the, that type of work that I'm invested in now too, I have, I have a, a knack for it. I love it. I love archaeology. I love just sitting there and just, re, you know, surrendering myself to the, you know, waiting for them. Hopefully they don't hit something, but I'm always aware and I feel a vibration of that presence of the spirit of the person. If there's cultural stuff there, I can feel that vibration of it. And I know other people have too. I'm not the only one. It's just that when you're, when you're involved and when you're, when you've invested in that, amazing things happen. You know, you start listening to needs of people. You start listening to the um, the psychic call. You know, that psychic hotline of someone like you. You've done it. You've thought of somebody and they call. Yeah, you know, I just said your name. Or I just thought of you. We right. all have it. But when you live that, when you pay attention to it, it, the more it happens. And so when I'm out there doing archaeology, I said, I got to get up. I got to go out there. And sure enough, there'll be something there. How many people know the language? Very, very few. That's one of the hardest things. You have to have people to talk to. The language was tucked away in written form. Now it's getting digitized by one of my tribal members who's up north, and he's been working with the Harrington Notes and Smithsonian, getting a lot of those old recordings uh, and, and coordinating the writing with the, um, with the uh, audio. Mm -hmm. And so it's becoming much easier. There's a, there's a language uh, community up north in Davis, uh, Breath of Life it's called, mm -hmm. for the revitalization of California Indian languages. And so they have workshops from time to time. They'll have scholarships to send people to the Smithsonian in workshops, or they'll have like a weekend out at Davis uh, of indigenous people that are carrying language still to kind of give that incentive. How many languages in California? Oh, there's hundreds, That's what I mean. hundreds. But it, even within our own culture, there's eight languages and they're very distinct. We used to call them dialects, but when you look at, at um, Ojai, for instance, the word is Ajai, meaning moon, but you, if you're from up north, San Luis Obispo, it's Awa. And the tar that seeps out of the ground here in the Ventureño dialect, you say Yap. But if you go to the Obispeño, San Luis Obispo in that area, it turns, the word turns into Pismu, 
Oh, which is where Beach. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I can figure that one out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's a very difficult way to learn language. Hopefully, I don't think they've included it like in the Rosetta Stone yet in that particular. You, you have to and you, you have to do it as a group. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really, you know, I spent so much time teaching the culture that I was just talking to, to our tribal member with the language, said I want to be able to do a whole presentation in my language, but nobody allows you that much time, because mm. <laughs> then you'd have to translate it all. Right, right. <laughs> so, but little bits, you know, we've picked up and learned songs and animal names and stories, phrases, things like that. Well, this has been delightful. I mean, Thank I don't know you. if there's anything you, that you'd like to share that we haven't talked about. I do believe that there, there are so many people who don't know about our culture. I mean, it's because we don't have that cultural center that there are other opportunities to learn about our culture th uh, other than, you know, the kind of things people will make up about our culture and, and the, the kind of misinformation that people learn about us that Santa Barbara Museum has a wonderful you know website there are uh, you know pow you can't really go to a powwow and learn about us you know that just uh, that doesn't work so um, you know when be invested in when your kids are learning mm -hmm. because I think the the education curriculum is getting better also too is that when you learn your your environment the, so if you're out on the coast and you see what's growing yeah. seasonal start thinking seasonally in your brain and, and why, you know, these people here wore so few clothing, you know, as opposed to the Lakota people in the, in the Midwest or, you know, the East Coast, because it's so cold there. Here, our weather was, was supreme, but it did get cold. So, you know, learning those type of little things, you get to kind of get a sense of the abundance of what native plants in our area, you know, have as far as food resources, wood, games, ornamentation, all that stuff. You can see how, how what a, you, people, even though they did move around from place to place, there were these permanent villages that just held people for so long. And if you're prepared and, and paying attention to these El Ninos and weather, using your information from your weather doctors, you knew when to stay in, you knew when to start gathering stuff and storing and, pay, you know. Uh, so, you know, I think it's just being more aware of your, your environment and where you're living. People from out of town moving from the East Coast and all those other places that are, I mean, when I did the oil spill in Refugio Beach, some of the oil people, I said, have you ever worked in California before? No, ma'am. said, you know we have really strict environmental laws? Yes, ma'am. Have you ever worked with Native Americans before? No, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they knew nothing. There, we do have those strict environmental laws for a reason. Mm -hmm. And we mitigate all these things for a reason. And because once they're gone, they're gone. And including our archaeology, our, our sacred sites and burials, once they've been dug up, you cannot put them back. It's really difficult and it's sad when you've got to do that kind of work. So, you know, to, to, for other people coming here, buying up, I see Ojai sometimes just being destroyed by people, you know, just digging things up and these beautiful ranch homes that are now, you know, these McMansions and things, it's sad. So, you know, so, you know, enjoy the land instead of just developing it, you know, and just what, what's there. You know, so, yeah. and no, learn the laws of California <laughs> and stop interpreting them them wrong. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, Julie, thank you. Mm, this you're has welcome. been delightful. Thank you. And uh, thank you. it's such a rich history and, and, and I encourage people to, to study it, get involved. I love the idea of when your kids are into it, you get into it too. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, yeah. that works on all mm -hmm. levels. Yeah. So, That's, thank right. you very much. Thank you. Thank Good you to see very you again. much. All right. <laughs>